right, folks. Welcome back to Crypto Unlocked. All right. I hope the left side of your brain is ready for a workout because we're about to go deep on the data. Number go up, number go down. We all know those. But I've heard there's a little more to it than that sometimes. So luckily, we've got a couple of great guides to unpack all the numbers, all the arrows, all the charts. Uh, and it's, it's a fireside chat. It's being led by my colleague Dominic Dantes, market analyst at Coindesk. And he's going to be speaking with Katie Stockton, the founder and managing partner of Fair Lead Strategies. And it's how to use charts and analysis to invest in crypto. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right. Thank you, Pete. Hey, everyone. Fired up. Great, great. <laughs> Awesome. It's great to be here. Welcome to Austin. Uh, so far, great time. And it's my pleasure to welcome my friend and former colleague, Katie Stockton. Katie produces technical analysis. She also manages an ETF. And this year, her firm, Fairly Strategies, won a technical analysis award for the winner for the best cryptocurrency research. Uh, Katie, welcome. Thanks so much, Dominic. Good great. to be with you today. Great to see you as always. So just start us off by giving us an overview of your discipline. So my focus is technical analysis, as mentioned, and that is the study of price trends. So what we're trying to understand are the markets through the analysis of supply and demand. So all of the information that we have out there boils down to a buy and sell decision. And that price ends up reflecting market sentiment, market psychology, and technical analysis is designed to measure that, and it really can enhance your success in investing and trading, especially in a very volatile asset class. We tend to use technical analysis primarily for risk management. I think that's where uh, it's just of the utmost importance that we have a way to manage risk in volatile environments. I think this year is pretty much a perfect example of that. Um, but we're also using technical analysis to discover opportunities, and for market timing purposes. So for trading purposes, if we're looking for entries and exits, the technical tools that we have at hand can really get us closer to those key levels of support, which is an area of buying pressure, or resistance, which is an area of selling pressure. So we believe that the cryptocurrency space is really uh, very, it's very applicable, this discipline, and uh, I'm happy to explore it with you today. Great. And your background was more on the institutional side. How did you convey that to the retail audience over the years? You know, we, we, I, my primary role was on Wall Street working as a, a publishing technical strategist. And we started um, in 2018. We branched out and formed our own company called Fair Lead Strategies. And now we're publishing research that covers equities, cryptocurrencies, uh, from a technical perspective because we felt like there was a, just a growing audience outside of the institutional side of the business. So it's not for just hedge fund managers anymore. Um, you know, everybody on Main Street has so much access to information these days and to charts in particular that you can really do it yourself and you can do it yourself in a systematic fashion and it's a very accessible discipline. I, I like to joke that uh, you know, it, it only takes me a couple seconds to have an opinion on something. Uh, because it really is solely price-based. Yep, and in real time, you know when you're right and when you're wrong, right? And a little bit of the misconceptions about TA, I think a lot of folks identify it as something where you can pinpoint the absolute high and pinpoint the absolute low. Talk to us a little bit about the risk management component of technical analysis. It, it really is essential, and, and we do try to, at times, identify those inflection points in real time, and we have tools that can get us closer to that. We'll look at a few of them today. And yet, to me, just to have a discipline is the first key to risk management. To have a process uh, that you're implementing on a regular basis, that is really the key to know that there's levels that below which, for example, there's more risk, or to be able to identify a breakout, which, of course, would increase potential reward. To have a sense of those key important levels and also key momentum shifts that to me is really added value in this process and again it's that regularity that i think can uh, really add the value great and then on your next slide you have we know there are thousands of indicators that we use in ta and they're all embedded on mathematical components right as cmts we study them and you have a very interesting way of organizing them into different buckets can you walk us through that 
That's right. So with, with our um, technical toolbox is what we call it. And this by no means is all encompassing in the world of technical analysis. This is really our methodology sort of in a nutshell. Uh, we divide it into sort of three different categories. Support and resistance, as mentioned, that's buying pressure, selling pressure. And then a whole suite of technical indicators that are at our disposal. And then we call it market internal measures, which originally really only applied to the equity market, but now we can apply it to some degree also to the cryptocurrency market. I like to classify technical indicators in three ways. So I divide them between trend following or momentum gauges, overbought, oversold gauges, and relative strength gauges. And to have one or two indicator for each of those categories, to me, is not doing too much, but you're getting a sort of a full swath of what you need to take away from the charts. And I think that that, as part of a process, is a great place to start. So to, to just start to watch the charts and, and get to know what suits you in terms of time horizon, in terms of understanding, are you a momentum trader? Are you a long-term investor that likes to buy into basing phases? Everyone has a bit of a personality in that regard. So I think you um, originally can just start with these technical tools and, and see what suits you just by looking at the charts. It's a very, very visual approach to the markets. Great, and it's also the component of keeping it simple, right? <laughs> you go on Twitter, you see a lot of people with five indicators on one chart and they all tell you the same thing. So I think it's very important to uh, distinguish between what they're telling you, right? And then the next slide, putting all this into practice with the current environment, how important is sentiment, especially for the cryptocurrency market? Sentiment is, is really key for all markets um, because it, going back to that um, thought that all the information that we have available to us, all of the fundamentals about these companies or all of the information about the new technologies, all of the macro data, all of the political information, all of the geopolitical risks, they do boil down into what, what do you, how does that make you feel? How are you going to position in this type of environment? And so gauging that market sentiment we can do through price, but also through other indicators that fall into that kind of market internals category, which also has sentiment. We have breadth, which is sort of the participation um, in the equity market would be how many stocks are going up on up days, as an example. Uh, things like volume, what is the volume behind a, a, a security, and it, what does that mean? Is it, is it seeing more volume on a breakout? Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, and leadership, where is the leadership coming from? We apply that to cryptocurrencies in more of a rotational mechanism to try to understand if the market's characterized by risk on or risk off, and that's valuable information to have the indicator that you see on the screen here, it's called the Fear and Greed Index. We have one for equities, and we also have one here for cryptocurrencies, and it's sort of a, an aggregation of several different indicators that taken together can give you a sense of how people feel about the cryptocurrency market right now. And this suggests, what is that number? I can't read it, 19% or 30%. Mm -hmm. So it, it suggests that less than 20% of people, uh, maybe even in this room, feel great about cryptocurrencies right now. And, and that does provide a contrarian takeaway. So when the market bottoms, you tend to sense that investors are incredibly bearish. And so we can still get more bearish than 19% per se. But to me, um, it does create this stuff of a market low. We need to have that kind of overly bearish sentiment for the market to bottom because it means the last seller has sold. So I would argue that we're not there yet in terms of the cryptocurrency downdraft that we've seen. Uh, but you know, once we see these single digits and these sentiment gauges, well, that's where we start to really pay attention. Mm. Got it. And it also coincides with overbought, oversold in a way, right? And when you're talking about sentiment in the crypto market, it kind of follows the direction of the equity market, right? Mm -hmm. So talk to us about the correlations that you've been seeing, especially with the NASDAQ and Bitcoin. Yeah, and I don't know which follows which right now, <laughs> but, but we, we do know, and you can see it in this graph, which compares Bitcoin and then the uh, Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ 100 index comparison. Uh, you know, we're near all time highs in terms of the correlations. That is not uncommon in a downtrending market. It's when you get that kind of risk off sentiment that investors are just generally pe penalizing all risk assets. So that's what's happening right now. They're being lumped as, as sort of one in the same, whether that's right or, or incorrect uh, is to be determined, but it's certainly not acting like any kind of inflation hedge or anything like this. So, so we are respecting that correlation as being informational 
and we're, we're using it in a way to gauge our, um, let's see if I can get back here, to gauge our, our take on the NASDAQ 100 index itself. So the equity market, as we all are, are well aware, unfortunately, this year to date has been trending lower. That means lower highs and lower lows, and that reflects a loss of long-term momentum that started to manifest late last year, and that's indeed what we've also seen of course, with the correlation so high in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency market more broadly. Mm. And would you expect that correlation to flip or? I, I would expect it to contract, mm. but perhaps not flip anytime soon, especially as long as the markets are in this kind of bear market cycle. Um, and I, I emphasize cycle because I believe this to be for cryptocurrencies and equities to be a bear market cycle within a secular, secular bull market. So sort of a cyclical move that will ultimately resolve higher in what should be a major long-term low. So now that, that leaves us wondering when that low will be established, yeah. of course. <laughs> and we have indicators, as you saw on the other toolbox slide, to try to help us get to a point where we can identify those lows with some level of confidence. What you're seeing here on the screen is a, a Bitcoin chart. It's a monthly candlestick chart, so it's a very long-term picture. We like to think of a monthly chart as long-term, a weekly chart as intermediate term, and a daily chart as short-term, although some people in this room might be day traders and using hourly charts. But all of the indicators that you can find should apply to every time horizon. So with, with this indicator that you see in the second window of the chart, it's called a MACD indicator. It stands for Moving Average convergence, divergence, and it's one of these trend following or momentum gauges, and it can be really invaluable in terms of identifying major trend shifts, and unfortunately, you can see there, it's showing uh, long-term momentum to be quite weak and still also diverging, so still growing on the downside. And we wanna see some alleviation in that and also to see oversold readings come back in place and yield sort of an uptick in momentum. I'm sure if you all watch TV, you've seen people talk about overbought and oversold, and I think it's probably an overused term on both sides, um, but there is actually a measurable reading that tells you if something's overbought or oversold. And uh, you, you know, we don't think that oversold is necessarily a good thing until momentum is ready to shift. So that's what we look for. Mm. And then below this, you have the stochastic indicator, which can remain oversold for about a year, like what we <laughs> saw in the past bear market. Well, what are you gauging there? Yeah, well, we have limited price history um, mm. here, so we don't have a lot of examples to use. Uh, but, it, but for Bitcoin and, and just for anything that has trended lower at times, you can maintain an oversold reading. So I think you've probably heard that something that's oversold can always get more oversold. And indeed, that is the case. So, so we want to wait for that oversold reading, which on the, the stochastic oscillator pictured in that bottom window, when that's below 20%, but then also hooks back above, because that reflects that sh shift that would tell us that maybe we have a major long-term low at hand. Mm, got it, got it. And then your next chart, I think you talk about ETH, right? Or Bitcoin on a weekly chart. Yeah. Right, so this is kind of zooming in a little bit to the more intermediate term view of Bitcoin. And this is what we publish in our weekly cryptocurrency compass report. It's a really important chart, and you can see the volatility here. Um, it's a weekly cloud-based chart, so if you see the shaded area on the chart, that's a long-term trend-following gauge. And when price goes below that cloud, that's when we're in a bear market cycle. And indeed, that's where we are at, at this time. And yet, you can see an oversold condition on an intermediate-term basis here and downside momentum. So we're trying to reconcile all this and try to determine how we can manage risk in this type of environment so we can identify the posture of the indicators and then we can identify the key support and resistance levels based on any number of factors. And I think that that's where the identification of the support and resistance is just something that comes over time by looking at a lot of charts. So that's what I would encourage you first to do is to set up you know, on part of your screen a little space for a chart and just keep watching it and you'll start to understand sort of the characteristics of the security that you're tracking. Um, you know, it can be as obvious as a 200 day moving average, which is a very widely followed level. Um, for us, we like to use Fibonacci retracement levels. It, the Fibonacci's are really fascinating. We won't go into it in too much detail here, but uh, for Bitcoin, the support that we're watching is based on a Fibonacci level, and it's roughly 27,000, just, just north of 27,000. So if that level is broken, that to us is an, a risk metric, uh, below which, unfortunately, the next support 
is roughly 19,500 down to uh, sort of the mid-18,000 range. So naturally that gives you sort of a sense of what risk might be mm -hmm. if we do see a breakdown, and then you can do with that information as you please. Got it. And what's the importance of staying with the trend? And I know you use some counter trend indicators. Can you talk about how you marry the two? That's right. So we, we are trend followers. Uh, there are some technicians who are more about counter trend positioning because counter trends, uh, when you get these moves, they can be really explosive. And in fact, we've seen that recently, yeah. not, not as much in Bitcoin, uh, but certainly some, some of the altcoins and, and the equity market, we, we get these big snapbacks and people like to take advantage of those. But those are very difficult to take advantage of because they're short lived. So we are more inclined to stay with the direction of the prevailing long-term trend, which is lower at this time. Um, so we are not recommending new long exposure, buying these, these coins at this time, but rather if you hold the position, you'd sell into strength mm -hmm. to avoid another downdraft or retest of support. So that's how we're thinking through the positioning based on the combination of, of the momentum gauges and also the overbought oversold gauges. But once that bearish sentiment has enough of an impact that we get that a, a reaction to oversold readings on a long-term basis that appears meaningful, that's where we'll feel more comfortable saying, okay, now we're ready to get back in with a long-term outlook. Got it. And I think your next slide goes into risk on, or oh, Ether, right? So what are you telling us about Ether? Well, Ether, uh, you know, <laughs> very highly correlated, as you know, to Bitcoin. And, and uh, we use almost Bitcoin and Ether as sort of a gauge of risk on and risk off in the space. Um, in fact, when we skip forward uh, to that mm -hmm. end, this is a ratio of the two. And this is, goes to that kind of relative strength category and the technical indicators that we use. The ratio can tell you when people are positioning offensively or defensively within a category. And of course, you've seen Bitcoin outperforming with the uptrend in this ratio of late, and that's reflected risk off positioning because Bitcoin's seen as a bit of a safe haven in the cryptocurrency arena. So that's something that's been established. And, and unfortunately, with the breakout that we've seen in this ratio, it suggests that we'll probably see more of the same mm -hmm. and, and doesn't give us confidence that we already have a long-term low in place. We do feel like we have a short-term low in place for, for most altcoins, especially and when you do get these relief rallies, you tend to see high beta outperformance, broadly speaking. So that means the names that got beaten up the most on the downside will probably do best on the upside, but it's really difficult to capture those counter trend moves. Yeah. And another one is a Bitcoin dominance ratio, which measures Bitcoin's market cap relative to the total crypto market cap, exhibiting the same type of breakout as Bitcoin versus ETH. And then you have here a relative rotation chart. Tell us about what that is. I love this. Um, <laughs> so this is an animated look at sort of sub, um, sub cryptocurrency market rotations. And if you can imagine the crosshairs as, as being representative of Bitcoin, and this shows trailing history for 12 weeks for various altcoins relative to Bitcoin. When you see something pointing up and to the right, that's when you're getting outperformance with growing momentum. So it's a normalized way to evaluate rotations within the cryptocurrency market. And we all hear about cyclicality. We all um, you know, believe that it's out there, but I think this is a really good visual representation of it. It's called a relative rotation graph. It's not my um, it's sort of proprietary model, but it's um, a really, really great tool out there. And uh, we like to look for rotations into these altcoins as indicative of risk on. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then you, man you also produces this on a weekly basis, right? So you look at which altcoins are performing versus not, right? That's right. We, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we essentially, we look for the altcoins to come back and try to gauge their upside potential mm -hmm. and where we have a better selling opportunity, essentially. So that, that RRG work can help us understand where there's near-term app performance likely and whether we should wait to reduce mm. or add. Got it. And then putting all these indicators together into a suite, how do you establish an investable universe and create a systematic process going forward? And I think that's uh, the hard part, but, and it's very personal, really. Um, so once you get to know the charts, just by simply looking at them and watching levels, and once you have a suite of tools, whether it's indicators or moving averages, I, I do encourage you to do some reading, um, just education. There's something called the CMT program, Chartered Market Technician. It's like our version of the CFA, if you know of that. Um, but then from there, you, once you have all of this information, to develop it into something that's a, sort of a systematic process is really key. 
So we've done this with our ETF, which is called the Fairly Tactical Sector ETF, or TACK. And this is an equity-focused product. We're, we're excited for hopefully someday an ETF <laughs> focused on <laughs> cryptocurrencies. We will see. Um, but, but for us, we defined a universe that suited our process. So it might be for you uh, trading, I don't know, 10 of the top uh, altcoins. Um, and then once you have that investable universe, you can apply your technical indicators or toolbox regularly over the time frame that you've determined suits yourself. So that could be intermediate term, it could be very long term. Uh, once you have a sense of that sort of universe, that gives you a framework within which to, and it makes it so it's not uh, just unwieldy in terms of the process. You, you need to have, um, you know, to come in every day or every week, whatever it may be, to know what you're looking for and what you're looking at. So, so that's where we would start next. And then you have an asset allocation process, right? There are different uh, ETFs that you would, or not ETF sectors that you would put into the risk on versus risk off bucket. Can you walk us through that? That's right. So for the TAC fund, we are using sector ETFs primarily, as you saw on the previous mm -hmm. slide. And then from there, once we have uh, applied our indicators, applied our models, and done so in a systematic fashion, there's a whole process around portfolio construction, and I think this is something that's not inherently technical in nature, but it is important because it helps you also manage risk, because maybe the cryptocurrency portion of your portfolio is very small, and you want to treat it as part of the whole in this process, or maybe it's a, just a cryptocurrency portfolio with which you're, you're treating it um, as, a, as a holistic portfolio. So what we did with TAC and uh, what we hope to do someday with the cryptocurrency market is we created a, a fund that has eight buckets. And when the market's firing on all cylinders and all of the sectors are exhibiting positive long-term momentum and relative strength, which is what we like to see, then those buckets will be filled by sector ETFs like you see here on the left in the blue. And then at times, of course, like now, the market's not firing on all cylinders and we'll see it move a bit more risk off in its characteristics, both on the sector front, and we have an asset allocation piece in this fund where we move into treasury, short-term and long-term, and also gold, ETFs representing those spaces, and we end up with a balanced portfolio in an environment where the technical indicators or our system is not lining up in that way. So that's just one example of how you can go about constructing a portfolio. But again, it goes back to kind of having that regular um, approach to the same discipline. Mm -hmm. Got it. So for a crypto audience, <clears throat> this would be more about overweighting a Bitcoin, underweighting the altcoins during risk off. Um, would that be a similar scenario? It, it definitely would. And, and looking for catalysts. So when, when you use the technical tools, the technical indicators, for us, we're always looking for shifts. We want to understand when something is changing. Uh, the trend following piece is actually not that hard. You could almost throw on a very simple moving average and understand what the prevailing trend is. What we really want uh, to understand in terms of risk management is when that trend is reversing. Mm -hmm. So to have some mechanism or indicator that will give you a defined buy or sell signal, uh, that to us is invaluable because it takes out some of the guesswork or gray area of the market and it allows you to know systematically whether um, you know, Solana has a reversal. And, and you can take that information and develop it into some kind of holistic portfolio. But to your point, Dominic, yes, risk on versus risk off is really key. So um, you know, when, when the market goes risk off like it is now, it can mean for some people just simply go, move, going to the sidelines, right, and, and investing in something alternative, perhaps, or even just sitting in cash. Mm -hmm. But for other people, they want to stay invested, mm -hmm. and maybe they could take short exposure. So there's just different sure. um, ways to kind of approach it, and it really comes down to your personality as a trader. Got it, great. And you just reached 100 million under management, right? We did, yeah, <laughs> just, just last week. So. Fantastic, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it's awesome to go into that position from being the anal analyst and putting it straight into work and having others you know, participate in that. So kudos to you, I think it's a great accomplishment. Thank you, Tom. And for the next slide, uh, you also produce the research, right, on a weekly basis. Where can folks go and how can they get involved? Yeah, and I, I think to the point of uh, sort of being regular in what you're looking at and, and watching, uh, when we first started to monitor the cryptocurrency market, it took us a long time to get from watching it to then actually applying uh, the analysis in yeah. a, a systematic fashion, and then it took even longer to, for us to get it so we were publishing it to our client base. And so now we have a weekly report that we have developed that 
it's really very simple and digestible where we're um, simply showing those weekly charts of mm -hmm. Bitcoin and Ether with the indicators that we find important, although there's so many out there that are, are very valuable. Um, and it really is in how you're combining the indicators, I would say, at any given time that you can get a correct or incorrect takeaway. Mm -hmm. It's never the indicators that let you down. It's all human error. So, <laughs> so there are times at which people will say, well, technical analysis isn't working right now. And I said, no, 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 it's our fault. The indicators are always working. It's in how you're combining them or how you're interpreting them uh, that that user error comes into place. But what we're trying to do with the research and what we would encourage everyone to try to do is to, to understand sort of probabilities and takeaways mm -hmm. from the charts at any given time. So if we know there's long-term downside momentum, which there is, well, then we're less inclined to give a lot of weight to an oversold reading until we get that improved momentum. And then also we consider where is support, where is resistance? Well, Bitcoin's not terribly far from support. It is coming off of a, a recent low, and that to us gives us a little peace of mind here in the near term that we should see more of a relief rally in Bitcoin. We look for resistance. In fact, we're looking for resistance around these moving averages, which are in this sort of 35,000 range. So to us, 35,000 would be a natural place for a relief rally to meet resistance for Bitcoin. But to have that information, and not trying to be ultra predictive, but to have that in mind when we're taking a position one way or the other, uh, we find gives us the confidence to move forward and to yep. do it in a way that we know what our defined risk is um, if we choose to take that risk. So, yep. so with this report, we uh, present our views, we prevent, present important levels, and then we also do some relative strength work. So that, that same relative rotation graph that you saw, the rotational one that was animated, uh, we, we track that on a short-term basis to try to understand if there's short-term movement, almost as a mm -hmm. gauge of market sentiment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also the Bitcoin Ether ratio, and, and we're you know picking up on some interesting new data points that are, I would say, in that kind of market internals category um, that I know you really traffic in more than we do. And we're trying to find you know any value out there in some of the data that's new to the market. So we're, we're playing around with some new, new tools there as well. Yeah, definitely. I think the combination is what really enhances the value. You know, we also look at on-chain data at, at CoinDesk. We use a lot of Glassnode. And if you track the movement of coins on the blockchain, it kind of aligns perfectly with the support and resistance in terms of uh, aggregating like the average cost basis of coins. Um, you can definitely see that you know, calculated there. And I think you touched on an important disclaimer before, right? This is not an accurate sort of pinpointing buy and sells. It's more of uh, defining your risk parameters, right? And as a trader, you want the highest re reward for your risk. Um, and I think that's how you utilize it the best, right? Yeah, I, I think so too. And I, I think it goes back to the word systematic. And it doesn't have to be a trading system or model or something ultra sophisticated. Uh, but to have some tools that give you a more objective takeaway that you're going back to repeatedly. If you go and take a technical indicator and you back test it in individually with no other indicator, you might be underwhelmed by the results because there is no holy grail of these technical indicators. They all have a little bit of a different benefit to them perhaps, whether it's trend following, overbought, oversold, relative strength, looking for inflection points. But taking them all together, or at least finding one or two that you feel uh, can get you closer to those inflection points and help you manage risk, I think that's the best way to go about it. And there is just so much information available. I, I know that we, we like the Trading View website. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, Trading great. there's some great free services out there as well where you can um, source glossaries of terms and different indicators. And uh, you know the, the old textbooks regarding technical analysis, as much as they're old. Uh, they do have some good information, and, and it's a discipline that has evolved, certainly, but more has evolved in the, the capacity, right? So I, I can review 500 charts in an hour and a half now. Of course, that wasn't possible when I was hand charting. So, <laughs> so it has evolved in a, in a way that we have more capacity. Uh, but some of the tools that we're using have been around for uh, the cloud model that you saw for one. Uh, that's been around since the 1800s. So, so these tools, you can find a lot of information about them out there. And candlesticks were used by the Japanese rice traders. That's right. right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so that's it, 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 again, it's just all about evaluating the supply and demand. And you know, treating these cryptocurrencies and other securities as something that are subject to market influences, which is almost unfortunate because I always think about with the equity market, if you're buying a stock based on the fundamental prowess of that company, uh, and it just isn't acting right, 
Well, that's where you can uh, benefit from using the charts because unfortunately, I think it, my, one of my mentors once said, well, 70% of, uh, of a given move in any stock is driven by the market, the broader market, and its sector. And I, I don't think we can really quantify that, but it, it does make sense because especially when we're seeing some risk off behind the market like we have had lately, the correlations do tend to go very high and it goes for asset classes, it goes for individual equities and cryptocurrencies. So with those tighter correlations, it makes it more difficult to really um, add value by doing that kind of bottom up research. So we have to be super respectful of the top down um, inputs that we can get from these sort of bigger benchmarks for various spaces. Great. And then has it been difficult getting accurate pricing data? I know that's very important, right, for the crypto universe. And can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I mean, it's an exercise in frustration, I will say. Um, and, and so I find that we often source sort of multiple places for different indicators. Um, so I, I can't say that I have the right answer for you, but, but we have found TradingView to be quite good uh, and robust in terms of the technical indicators that you can use there and, and the data. Uh, but there's some that are missing. We, we use something called the DeMarc indicators as one of our preferred overbought or sold measures. And it's really difficult to find good data that, that has that kind of outlet. So, so it's, it is frustrating. I think it can only get better, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but you know, just to have, again, to go back to the same system is important because you don't want to switch around so much that you're actually seeing different data and different indicators. Yeah. Exactly. And Coindesk was working hard. We have an index team, so we're aggregating that price data into the XBX Bitcoin index, and a lot of the institutional audience are using that to build ETF products, right? Because you need the accurate index price data to then apply it to the products that you're selling. Um, and TA will be definitely value-add in that respect, right? I think so. And, and in terms of creating or constructing a dynamic portfolio of mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies, I think technical analysis is truly one of the best ways to go about that, especially now when there's still not a ton of information out there, certainly not a ton of uh, regular, professional, consistent um, flow um, in terms of research that's available uh, you know, from a fundamental perspective. There's just, we, we are hungry for more information and with all of the stuff that's out there, of which some of it you can't even um, trust, I think to have something that um, is just price-based can really be valuable in terms of you know, the market timing element where you can move between cryptocurrencies that have greater upside potential based on the way those momentum gauges set up. So that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the indication now to get more all in in the cryptocurrency market and uh, we think it may more likely based on what we're seeing happen after the summer months. Mm. Um, so, so that will be hopefully a nice um, way to kick off the fall. You guys can relax over the summer and <laughs> take a break. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much. I think we're running out of time now. Um, so folks can head over to fairleadstrategies.com, right, to find your reports. Um, also, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, at, I think one at the Fairmont, I'll be doing an overview of all of this into practice so you can come on over and see the charts in real time, which will be a lot of fun and interactive with the audience. Um, and then later today at 5, I'll be hosting an ETF panel, which will be really interesting. So hope to see everyone there. Um, thank you so much, Katie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dominic. Always great, great to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Thank you, everyone.